with Labushkin, you know, the reason I was 50 50 on him is because, like I, I kind of alluded to, I don't really know where he fits. So mm-hmm. when I just look at the top six right now, you know, Riley Brody, you probably want playing together, right? You know, you've got Riley Brody, Sandine, Muzzin, and Giordano who all shoot left. And then you've got Labushkin and Lilligren who shoot right. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any there's there's any world next season where Lilligren and Sandine are not in the lineup on a given night if they're healthy. I think you have to play those guys because I think they're your future, period. And they they proved it this year that they were both really good in limited playing time. So then that leaves me with either Labushkin or Muzzin playing you know on on the right side or whatever Giordano can play the right side if you want to do that because we know Muzzin doesn't like doing that so it just leaves me between those two players Labushkin and Muzzin I think you know they play effective roles and they kind of play a similar role in the sense that they they can be relied on defensively and on the penalty kill and and you know they can make a good first pass if you need it for the most part but I don't really see a world where both of those guys are back in the lineup on a nightly basis because I think you have to play Lilligren and Sandine. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna make some good podcasts here because <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna disagree with what you said. Okay, okay. Um, and I, I don't think you need Lilligren and Sandine in your lineup all the time. I think in an ideal world you would because that means your young, your young players are taking another step. But if you look at just what happened a month ago when the Leafs were playing Tampa. Sheldon Keefe took out Lilligren, you know, partway through that series because he didn't trust him. And he put Justin Hall back in the lineup. And I think all of us would agree that Justin Hall's probably played his way out of Toronto. Yeah. But if Sheldon Keefe was announcing to the world, like, hey, this guy who has drastically underperformed this season is someone I still trust more than this young player. To me, I, I, I can't sit here and guarantee that Tim, Timothy Lilligren plays every single game come October. I hope he does. And I hope the same with Sandine, you know, because he still, as I've said, has has stuff to prove. But I think, you know, for me, the more prudent play would be, you know, if, if we have one too many defensemen, they'll figure it out, um, you know, come preseason, come the first part of the season as to who's going to be in the lineup and who's not going to be. And if you think, you know, your, your younger guys and Labushkin and Muzzin, you know, they're all competing for for spots and they all deserve to be in the lineup, um, you know, every night, then you make a move at that time. But for me, I just don't think Sheldon Keefe and Kyle Dubas would be super comfortable coming in with a top six um, defensive group that features both Sandin and Lilligren based on what we just saw in the first round. Okay, and fair enough. You're right. Like, Keefe would not put Justin Hall in the lineup if he trusted Timothy Lilligren more than he trusted Justin Hall, which makes total sense. But my response to what you said is, you know, what happens if game one of next season, it's Sandine who's on the bench? Because like I said, there's a log jam on the left side. And I think that that benefits Lilligren more than it does Sandine. So, you know, if you've got Riley Brody, say Muzzin Labushkin or, or Riley Labushkin, Muzzin Brody, uh, and then Giordano Lilligren, you know, and that leaves Sandine out. I don't know if that's good for the player. And if he's sitting game one, knowing how good he, he is or, or how good he thinks he can be in the future, wouldn't that disgruntle the player? Like, aren't you managing, aren't you managing personalities here at this point when every player here on the back end can play? I, I agree. It will disgruntle the player. But the NHL is not a development league. If, if you're concerned that, you know, Rasmus Sandin, uh, um, you know, isn't going to be living up to his potential because he's sitting in the press box, then, you know, that's that's not something that Sheldon Keefe needs to necessarily worry about. That's going to be for Kyle Dubas to figure out. So in, in my opinion, I think it, it kind of goes back to what I just said, where it's, you know, right now when you're envisioning your roster, I don't think that the guys running the Leafs can can sit here and say we are comfortable with both of these two guys in our lineup so much so that we're going to lose a player who we were very comfortable with in our lineup, you know, including a guy that that has played, you know, with our number one defenseman on our top pair. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in, yeah, if, if you come down to game one of the regular season and Sandin is scratched, 
but you don't think he should be because you you know you've seen him take a huge step up through preseason and he's doing everything right in practice then you know i think that's something that that probably gets sorted out over the first part of the season and and ultimately ends up uh resulting in in somebody getting moved um you know come come the first part of the season and that might not even be labushkin that could be jake muzzin um, yeah you know if labushkin is is outperforming him um you know so I, I my my preference in building a team is is depth bring as much depth in as you can let the pieces fall where they may and then figure it out after so i'd rather be in that position than you know starting game one with the six guys and Sheldon Keefe coming out or talking to Kyle Dubas after night one saying, hey, that guy right there, whoever it is, cost us three goals tonight. We got to go find a D. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point. Good teams are built through their depth. So it makes sense. You want to have guys who can fill in because, again, like there's going to be injuries, too. So you mm-hmm. need to have guys who can play. But my biggest worry, and I know this is Galaxy Brain, and we've been talking about this D this decor for a while, and we can move on here soon. But I know this might be a bit of a Galaxy Brain, you know, conversation. But what happens if signing Ilya Labushkin, you know, a player who on a lot of teams is not on your top pair, mm-hmm. or on some teams he's not even in your top four? What if signing that player? ends up in Rasmus Sandin being traded. I I would hate to see what that trade-off looks like, and I just, like, that that worries me. That worries me. Yeah, I mean, as a fan, I think that's worrying, but I I think if... Without trying to offend anybody, I I would say that if if you choose 28-year-old Ilya Lubushkin over 22-year-old Rasmus Sandin, you know, next season, so much so that you're trading the latter then that's just going to be poor player management, asset management. Um, You know, by no means am I suggesting that bringing back the one should result in the other leaving. I know. Um, You know, I think it's just a matter of whether those guys are ready to be in the lineup every night. If they are, great. If they're not, then... You know, whether it's Labushkin or somebody else, you know, Sandin's going to find himself in the in the press box watching, watching that guy some nights of the year. Um, but yeah, I, I would never I would never suggest that uh, they should be looking at trading Sandy. And I think that would be crazy. He's one of your top young players coming in. And if, if that happened, then fan base would probably ask some questions unless they got a huge return. Yeah, well, that's the thing, too, because yeah. what if, you know. And I mean, again, this is just like hypothetical yeah. galaxy brain. But like, what if they get a you know player to play in the top six? You know, who knows? But 